Welcome. Thank you for coming. So it turns out these are our pre uh, our uh, our presentation screens or whatever. Um, this is a pretty graphically heavy talk. So if you want to actually see what we're talking about, you might want to move up. Uh, if you don't want to get too close to us, that's okay. This is being recorded. It's being live streamed. Also, hello internet. Um, but a lot of we're showing some code and we're showing some stuff on there, and it's basically going to be impossible. I don't even know what we're gonna what we're gonna see on here. So anyway, thank you for coming. Yeah, move up, move up. Come on. I feel like I'm a like a rock star. It's like come on, move up. Come on, close the pit. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Oh, is this okay? This is actually water, so DefCon's not gonna poison me. Are we doing this now? Like while? Are we recording? Is this recording? Yeah. Let's better be. No, it's all. Is this recording? Yeah. Okay. We, can we do it anyway? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, Not allowed to drink on camera, yeah. or something. Okay. Here, you do your thing. <laughs> I, I haven't done it. You're, you, okay. The, so you don't want to explain the whole like. <laughs> so DefCon has a history of uh, new people doing speakers, and doing a shot when they do that. Uh, so this is a new speaker. So we're gonna do a shot. Yes. Shots. Oh, we can re we can turn that down too. Yeah. So, this is water, by the way. So you don't have to be pressured into actually drinking whatever that is. So, it's actually cheers. All water. Oh, I mean, it's all water, right? All so, water. this is Bruno's first talk at DEF CON, which is awesome, and I think it's I don't know my twenty first talk, but I've never gotten to do this. So, very cool. Cheers. Cheers. Ah, uh, refreshing. All right, now we can start. Um, yeah, so thank you for coming to the talk. My name is Joe Grand, and I am uh, a hardware hacker, uh, and I like hacking on things, and um, yeah, I love coming to DEF CON, so that's me. Yeah, and I'm Bruno, I'm from Germany. It was the first time to went to DEF CON two years ago, and now I'm first time on the stage, as you have seen, and yeah, really excited about it. Yeah, so this, this presentation is about a project that we did together um, to reverse engineer the RoboForm password generator, and we'll get into all of the details, but the, the presentation is, is about hacking time, and this is not a sensational talk. We don't have a name for our discovery, um, but it really kind of shows the problems that we face, well, I guess the, the advantages that we face if we're hackers, um, but kind of the problems of systems and security flaws and how they are going to kind of persist even if things have been fixed. Uh, so we're not the first to hack time, even though we would like to think that we are. Um, so we have some examples. I don't even remember. What, which one is this? Oh yeah, the time machine. Has anyone read this? I know Death Veggie has probably read the time machine, but H.G. Wells. Yes. Okay. Has anybody else read this? Yeah, it was sort of like the first mention, right, of like traveling back in time to change something else. Uh, of course, there are so many things of, of people hacking time. I chose a couple. I probably missed some. Um, anybody guess what? Is that even playing? I can't, I can't see from here. Oh, it's playing now. Anybody guess what it is before the words come up? Did, did you cheat? Is it already? Oh, no, it's already up there. Okay, Doctor Who, yeah. So um, Time Lords, of course. Put this one in for, for Leet Bunny of the Hardware Hacking Village. So Back to the Future, of course, right? Hacking time. And my personal favorite, which is why I'm wearing the t-shirt, is Hacker Man. Has anybody seen Kung Fury? Woo, yeah, like 10 people. Yeah, awesome. Oh, there's Jesse back there. Um, yes, Kung Fury, Hacker Man is the star of the show. So hacking time to go back and do all sorts of stuff that uh, needed to be properly completed. Um, what have I missed? Am I like, are we grossly misrepresenting hacking time? Is there any other? What was it? The what? The tenant? The tenant. Okay. Star Trek? Star Wars? I don't know. Nobody's, no Star Wars? Star Trek is, yeah. So, okay. So there's a lot of hacking time, right? We're not the first. Um, this thing that we found is kind of related to random number generators, pseudo-random number generators. We're also not the first people to discover a poorly seeded pseudo-random number generator. Um, we've known about this as a security problem for a long time, but it still persists over and over again. And we'll explain, if you're, if you're not familiar with different types of random number generators, we'll explain that and then sort of go into the details of why this is a problem in this particular situation. Yeah, so the... Um, generating random numbers is a complex problem for um, programmers and 
To really uh, generate true random numbers, you will need some type of um, entropy source. So, for example, uh, from the environment, there's uh, people using lever lamps, for example, or uh, some diodes which are creating noise to then really create this random stream of data. And on the opposite of that, there's um, these pseudo-random number generators. And um, even and they work um, with a seed. So with the seed in place, uh, you will always uh, generate the same sequence of random bytes um, with the same seed. And this is exactly um, where we can attack if we know the, the same seed um, at some point. Uh, as it was used in the past, then we can also generate the same randomness um, today. Yeah, and I guess this is only you know this is a known kind of issue with security and cryptography and generating random numbers being hard. Uh, it, it hasn't really been solved uh, besides using some of those entropy sources that are better, but that's not really a practical thing. So this is even like a CWE, you know, a commonly known vulnerability if you're designing systems that have some sort of secure element, you would probably want to study some of this stuff, right? So it's sort of, I feel like everybody in the security community probably knows these things, but may, maybe not. Um, but if you're selling a piece of software that is sold as a secure thing, you would probably want to know these things. Um, so here is like with CWE, this is one of many about pseudo-random number generators um, being these deterministic generators, right? Like what Bruno said, if you know what's coming in, you know all the numbers coming out, which maybe isn't always a problem depending on how it's implemented. So here, I can't even see it on here. So yeah, it's just sort of highlighting the main things about pseudo-random number generators being deterministic. Uh, we recommend maybe like don't use time as a seed because time is a known value. And if you're able to know what time is, even if you don't know exactly the time of how the random number generator is being seeded, you know a range of the numbers that are going to come out of the random number generator. And that's what we can take advantage of as we're hacking on things. So even though um, many programmers know it's a really bad thing to do, it still happens. And here are some examples like um, where it happens. One uh, is the Netscape Navigator. Which is uh, which? Think I think I uh, use the time and then the process ID plus the uh, process ID of the parent uh, process. So um, really reducing the entropy, so you can easily guess um, the the seed. Same with the with the router from uh, D-Link. Um, this one actually used just the time and then generated the VW, uh, VWPS uh, pin via these uh, via time which basically would allow you if you listen to the network and uh, wait for some vwps uh, to exactly know what pin uh, it will be then there's uh, qt pass i think it's the default uh, unix password manager and this one was actually really bad because it not even used the time but the milliseconds so it in the end it will came down to 1,000 possible seeds, which were then used to generate these passwords. Um, another example, the Kaspersky password manager also using the time. Telnot Compass X is actually a German company which is uh, doing alert systems and they had the management software to um, write to these RFID ships which you can then unlock doors and everything and to generate the um, AES key they also just uh, use time so you could go through the door and then brute force the um, the key just in a couple of seconds and milk said um, I think this one was um, also uh, there was a fallback for some uh, operating systems which also use time and then this one was used to generate private keys for uh, Bitcoin Bitcoin privacy keys and then, uh, yeah, they got generated and I think swiped uh, the wallets like two years ago or one year ago. So, uh, yeah, really, really bad. And yeah, then there's uh, Roboform where, where we talk about today. Yeah, and this is just a sampling, but you can see the years go back to 1995. And it's not just software, it's not hardware, it's web stuff. And that's what's really interesting about this. So this particular project, we're, we're picking on Roboform. And um, I mentioned I'm 
traditionally a hardware hacker, I normally hack on, you know, uh, embedded systems and electronics and that's sort of what I love to do. But I also, in that same time, have dabbled in reverse engineering software, usually firmware related to hardware, but it was fun to do a project like this where we're looking purely at hardware and seeing these implementation problems. Roboform is a password generator um, and password manager. It's claimed, they claim to be the first, so maybe around 2002, uh, not only to generate random passwords, random passwords, but also to store them, you know, so you can go back to them. And there's a lot of different password generators that are out there now. Uh, I'm just quoting directly from their website um, because I didn't want to say anything that was incorrect and get in trouble. So used by millions of people worldwide, individual users and small businesses to government agencies and leading Fortune 500 companies uh, made by a company called Cyber Systems, I think in uh, Virginia or Washington, DC. So yeah, one type of password generator and the reason that we started looking at this is Bruno and I had been working on some projects of recovering cryptocurrency for people in, in various ways, hardware and software stuff. And um, somebody had contacted us and said, hey, I have a lot of Bitcoin uh, locked and I had used the RoboForm password generator to generate my passwords that I then encrypted. Um, or did they encrypt the private key with? Yes. They, they had a true crypt container and there they uh, saved the password yeah. for the wallet. That yeah. they had used with RoboForm, right. So they yeah. generated the RoboForm password, saved it in a text file, encrypted it with TrueCrypt. That partition got corrupted, so he lost his password to the wallet. So that's sort of how we got into this. And um, at first when he emailed, it was like, what, are we going to brute force a 20 character? He thought it was 20 character, special characters, numbers, letters, like computationally infeasible to brute force, right? We're just not gonna do that. Um, so I remember turning him down and then Bruno was like, well, wait a second. Like it was a year later, I think he contacted us again. And Bruno was like, well, I had worked on this other project. Maybe we should take a look at it. Do you want to tell that? Yeah, so uh, it was a password generator, not very popular. It was called wireless key generator. And like the name suggested, it was to create a password for your Wi-Fi. And we had a customer before who used exactly that one and also encrypted his wallet with it. So we had a look back then and it just looked so crappy that I thought, okay, this can't be secure. <laughs> and it turned out it wasn't. So it, it was, I think, using Visual Basic 6. And this was like the worst randomness I ever saw in a coding language because it was not even like that you need to guess the seed but it was the way they implemented it. it. You have just an array of two million values that are pre-computed random. And then the seed only defines like the, the start position of that, um, of that list. So it will just, after two million um, generations, no matter what seed, you will always have the generated all possible values. So this one was really, really bad. Yeah, and this, and this, even though like we got into this because of cryptocurrency, like this is by no means a cryptocurrency singular problem. Anybody that has used this version of RoboForm and prior versions of RoboForm are susceptible to this type of attack. Actually, that's a question. How many of you have even heard of RoboForm? Okay, like maybe a quarter. How many of you actually use RoboForm? One, two, three, four, uh, five. That's pretty good. Okay. Um, did you use it in 2015 or earlier? Now we're like really got one. Okay. Have you changed your passwords? <laughs> okay. Yeah, cool. I guess maybe you will after the talk, but yeah, cool. Okay. Um, right. So it really is, it, it's something where you could pre-compute, you know, every possible password that had been generated. And that's what we're going to show you. So we started getting into this project and, um, Bruno started digging through the change log where, where this is a closed source piece of software. So all we have really is the change log, anything that the vendor decides to make public, change log and, and the binaries. Um, but Bruno had noticed this change here. Yeah, so we looked at the time and then said, okay, it needs to be version, I think 7.9 yeah. or something. And then um, we saw after that version, um, there was an entry which said, increase randomness of generated passwords. Yeah. Which is pretty weird. That's pretty weird for a password generator to say. Yeah. Right? Like, <laughs> wouldn't you imagine all of them would be? But that was the clue. So we basically knew from the person we were dealing with, Michael, uh, when his last access to the wallet was, which was like 2013, I think. So we kind of looked and seen like, okay, what did anything change? And that's when we saw this increase randomness of generated password. We go, wait, 
are all of the prior versions doing something that is not random or less random or weaker, and it just happened that the version that we were looking at fell into that. So this applies to everything up to this version, uh, and then we'll talk about sort of what has happened since this version, which we don't actually know is the TLDR of that. Um, okay, so let's get into the process of, of what we did. Um, Bruno lives in Germany, I live in Portland, Oregon. Uh, and we did a lot of remote work, which was super fun. And for those who know me, like I don't normally work with a lot of people at one time. I like to sort of hole up and just hack on stuff alone. So it's like finding people to work with is really cool. Um, and it was a lot of fun, like these late night Zoom sessions, sharing screens, like hacking on stuff. We did end up doing some stuff together in person at a conference. Um, it was like, I don't know, 24, 30 hours straight or something. And then I got on the airplane and fell asleep the entire time. So it was really like a fun example of like true hacking together. It was really cool. So the process, we basically started with some memory analysis and we'll explain each of these steps. Uh, memory analysis first, static analysis, uh, dynamic analysis, and then we built some custom wrapper to handle all of that. So if you're from the software world, you're probably like, oh, this is like a totally normal thing to do. But from a hardware world, it's like, it, it, it was interesting to be able to do it in like a, a full process, kind of go through everything instead of just dabbling with like, you know, one, one tool or the other. So that's, you know, we kind of go through this process and then um, hopefully we profit. Okay, so let's go into the demo of things. Um, we were gonna do live demos, but DEF CON really was like, you should just record your demos. And we know the demo gods, blah, 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 but I like to live on the edge. Um, but I finally gave in and said, okay, we're just recording these. So these are videos. Um, and you can play along at home, you know, afterwards and, and see that we're not lying or anything. So Bruno's gonna talk about Cheat Engine and we'll go into all the other steps. Yeah, so first we used Cheat Engine and it's uh, or originally made for games. I personally used it as a kid for um, cheating my favorite single player game so I didn't have to grind run hundreds of hours <laughs> to, to get my gear. And you can actually also use it for hacking. So I um, hope the video is playing now. Is it playing? We can't see that it's playing, so yes. Okay, Dean okay. is gonna be our video, our video thumbs upper for every video. Is that okay? Perfect. Okay, Dean says okay. So what we did here is uh, very simple. So with Cheat Engine, you can scan, edit, um, even you can freeze some parts of the memory so it can't be modified by the um, program anymore. And here we just searched for the uh, generated password and we found it. And which means that um, other password generators, for example, try to um, decrypt it in some way that you can't extract it from the memory or um, try to hide it or remove it after a certain amount of time um, because there's a risk involved if you have plain text passwords in the memory, but um, Roboform doesn't. And that's already good. Um, you can actually see that it's um, found twice. That's one time for the um, GUI, so what is displayed, and one time is um, in, the, in the memory of the internal logic, um, we found it. Yeah, and right when we saw that, we're like, oh, wait, it's in the clear, perfect. And then I think we were even, there was a couple different, there was like a DLL and an executable, and we're trying to figure out which piece of the code was plopping that into memory. But knowing that was there, we're like, all right, now it's in memory let's try to find out what routine is actually putting it in the memory and then kind of working backwards so we could then figure out where the actual password generator routine was happening within this entire blob of stuff. Because RoboForm, again, does not just generate passwords, there's all this other stuff that we had to kind of dig through to find the right thing. So we used Ghidra, thank you NSA, I'll continue to thank the NSA for that. One of the few things I'll thank them for. Or maybe the only thing, actually. Um, so this is, uh, kind of, it's going to show, let's see, I can't see it again, but this is like, this should be a time lapse. Okay, Dean says, yeah. So there's, you know, we're not going to show the whole process, but we basically started with this giant binary and we dug down little by little, starting to, to label things of what we thought it was of, oh, that looks like this. And we would change parameters and look again and like, uh, oh, sorry, with Ghidra we didn't, we were just looking at the, at the static static side. So things weren't changing. Um, but we basically narrowed it down to a point and Bruno found this first of like, that called a system time, right? It was like get time, I think it's time 64. And um, that was like, wait, this piece of code is calling time and then it's doing some stuff and then it's calling SRAND. So seeding the, the pseudo random number generator. That was a pretty big giveaway. And there was a couple other places where there was 
the pseudo random number generator being seeded, but there was no other call to time. And we basically figured out that this section was the section that we were actually interested in. Of this whole piece of code, like these couple lines where it's calling the system time, manipulating it, which basically what it was doing, because you can press the, every time you press the generate password button, it hits this code. If you press the button more than one time a second, if there was no manipulation of that time, the time wouldn't increase because this call system time is just returning time in Unix time since 1970, January 1st, 1970, uh, in seconds. So if you hit the, the button multiple times, they basically added some additional manipulation in there so you can press the button multiple times within a second and not get the same password. Um, and they basically are just adding a fixed constant or are they subtracting? Adding or, subtra or they're subtracting a subtraction. Yeah, I think that's like one. That. <laughs> yeah, they were subtract. No, they were. It was something that messed us up, and we'll actually talk about that. But they're doing a ma manipulation, and it basically is just jumping either ahead or backwards in time. So you can still generate the, the password if you know all of the time. It was just so they couldn't, you know, duplicate the same time in that same button press. So a pretty weak type of manipulation. Then it calls SRAND, and then it goes into the actual password generation routine. I guess what we could have done and what, what we were originally thinking is like, oh, we can just pull out that password generating block, put it into our own code, and then just sort of build the wrapper around it. Um, but it was so complicated when we started digging into the function that gets called after that was just ridiculous. And we didn't really want to go through that process. So we eventually thought like, okay, if we could confirm this, we'll just build some, a wrapper that will go and touch those values and then just let the, the rest of the code that's in the DLL do its thing. So once we could identify the, the static portion of code where we knew that that pseudo random number generator was being seeded with time, then we went to x64 debug and we were actually using x32 debug. Uh, and this was our dynamic analysis to be able to debug the system as it's running in real time and see what was happening with the registers and with other low level CPU stuff. So then we could see if we could manipulate it. And this is going to be interesting because again, I can't see stuff here. So we're going to start it. And I'm pretty sure what I'm showing first is uh, there's a bunch of breakpoints that we set. So we can actually, you know, run the code and then it's going to hit the breakpoint at certain times when certain pieces of code are run. We basically set the breakpoint that we care about at that same spot that I just showed. So when the system time is being called. And then I'm probably running the, running the, the, the debugger, eventually the, Password generator is going to start. The GUI is going to start. And even when you first start the GUI, there's already one password that's in there. So it actually already runs the password generator once. Uh, so that, that manipulation has already happened once, which for us threw us off again a little bit. And I think it's eventually going to stop, but I'm generating passwords. And if you look, which you probably can't see, the EAX register is directly correlated to the system time, plus like whatever manipulation maybe there was from the from the call before. And has it stopped yet? Is it just sitting still? Still going. Okay. So um, I'm going to generate a couple passwords. And then at one point, I'm going to write down, there was one value that I don't have on this slide. It's on the next slide. I think it's like 66CF6550 in hex for EAX corresponds to one particular password. And that's the one that we're going to end up redoing once we let the system generate some more. Has it stopped? Okay. So this is what we care about out of all of that. The two arrows, there's one arrow pointing to EAX and then there's one arrow pointing to the password that's been generated. So those two things are completely intertwined. Anytime we enter the EAX value of that particular time, manipulated time value, it's going to generate that particular password. So let's continue on with that part of the demo. And now I'm going to generate another password just to show again that EAX continues to increment because time is incrementing. And then once we get it sort of cleared the EAX value with a new one, then we'll go back and replace it with one we know to show that we can, you know, regenerate passwords that have already been generated from the past. I'm just going to watch your reactions so I'll know when it actually happens. When it does go, ooh, or something. Tension. Ooh, right? So, <laughs> so now we have regenerated a password. 
in theory, with a properly, you know, computationally, crypt cryptographically secure system, that shouldn't happen. But this proved to us with the debugger of like, nice, now we can basically feed in whatever EAX value we want for time. And the manipulation doesn't really matter because that just changes kind of the date range a little bit. But we could pre-compute everything if we were able to tap right into that part, hook into that part of the DLL, add our wrapper code around it to get to that part. And this was, this was pretty cool. Oh, and this is the hacking time, right? So now, do you get it, right? We're hacking time to change that. So that was, yeah. Um, okay, so then the wrapper code. This was something just to put it all together, give us a way that we could pre-compute all the passwords that we wanted to for the date range that mattered for us. And we did it in, I think just, what was it? Visual, I don't even remember. It was in Visual Studio, yeah, Visual Studio. And we did it in C, which I know is like taboo now, can't use C, but I use C. And I use assembly language. And it actually was, it was cool because we had to tap into some of the, we had to do some assembly language to, to move some things around to get it properly executing in the DLL. Um, and C and assembly language really for sort of hardware hackers, that's like, that's what you want to see. Um, because that's the type of a level that we work with. So here's the wrapper code. Um, I have a couple slides sort of scrolling through the code. This is all open source, by the way. It's on my website. There's a link in the slides and these slides will be up on the DEF CON server after the session, whenever DEF CON puts them up. Uh, they're also on my website, which is grandideastudio.com. I put them on my, that's like my formal website. But everything is there, so you could um, already work with it, and somebody already has, which we'll talk about. So yeah, this code basically is, um, let's see, the video is kind of showing different sections, but this first section, we're just setting the time values that we want, the time range that matters. And then it should be scrolling down a little bit, but kind of showing some functions as we're, as we're getting ready. We're basically, we need to have code that's going to hook into the DLL. So it has to search through the DLL. This is not an exported function. Is that the right terminology? It's not a function that you're normally supposed to access from the outside world, right? I see nodding. Okay. So it's something where we know the code is there, but it's not given to the, you know, to the other executable to normally be able to, to work with. So we had to search for a known signature string that we found just by looking in the debugger. Uh, to say, okay, let's just look for these kind of op codes and, uh, and hope that's the right section in the DLL. So we're kind of searching through for that. And let's see, what else? We're going to look for the, yeah, so these are all the functions and set system time. I think here's the real code. So yeah, this code here, we're, you know, we're calling system time and we're basically setting our computer at whatever system time we want. And then, oh, there's also, there's some other constants I'll get into. There's like a bunch of weird stuff that we had to end up doing to make it work. It seemed, it seemed easy in theory of like, oh, let's just hook into this DLL and like call the code. But things have to be prepared before that to actually make it work. So where we are in here, is it still scrolling or can you, still scrolling and now it stopped? Okay, so yeah, this is the, the part that should be searching through the DLL, finding that portion, finding the address of the DLL with the, that, those opcodes that we want. And that's the exact same stuff that we saw um, in x64 debug and in Ghidra. Uh, the upper memory is going to change though, right? Because we don't know where the DLL is going to be loaded in memory, so we kind of know. But being able to search through it uh, automatically seemed to make sense. Then there's a whole bunch of different parameters. I don't know if you noticed on that RoboForm screen, but there's one for, do you want to use uppercase, lowercase? Do you want to use letters? Do you want to use numbers? Do you want special characters? Those are all individual settings that get fed into that password generator routine after the pseudo random number is generated. So we had to figure out how those parameters were configured before we could actually call the, the function that was generating the password. And that took a lot of trial and error and a lot of debugging and um, as it should be, right? If it was too easy, it, it wouldn't be that much fun. Um, but it was really interesting to kind of see that a lot of those values were, had to be placed in certain memory locations and specific things. And that's what that array at the beginning was of like, we just happened to see that, oh, this setting was in this one. And then we have a couple bytes that we don't care about. And then we add another one. And then we get to the cool stuff, which we're basically looping and we're calling system time setting all the values the right way. And then we get into the assembly language, which is my favorite part. And I don't really know. I think it's maybe this part that shows the rest of it. But we're moving the parameters into the right spot. We're moving everything into the right spot. And normally what was happening is we were getting crashes for days, right? Or yeah. uh, over and over again. And then finally, it's like, we're going to try another thing, try another thing. And then it finally worked and we generated a password. We're like, holy crap. Um, then we built the loop around it. So we're just doing this over and over again, setting the time, calling the DLL, 
you know, getting the password out because the password gets set into some register that, you know, that's where it was that we saw in Sheet Engine. Then we push that into a variable in C and then we print that out. And uh, turns out it wasn't the most efficient way to do it, but it definitely like was enough to generate the passwords. So we had all of our passwords. Is this, is this actually showing the password generator? Oh, it is. Okay, right. So we actually got it working. Um, this is generating all of the passwords starting from whatever 2013 date range we wanted uh, at about 100 passwords per second, which for us was fine because we only had, it was like a couple months worth, so it wasn't a huge amount. And it took, on my machine, I think it took like 20 hours or something, but yours was like super long. Yeah, I think you had the M2 SSD, so Windows really limits the, the amount of time. Yeah, there was like disk access, right? Like, yeah. Yeah. So I, I needed like three or four days. Yeah, to do the list, right? And that got really frustrating when it's like we tried different password lists that we were generating, plopped them into the password cracker, you know, tried, tried to unlock this, this Bitcoin wallet, and um, we kept failing. And we're like, oh my God, is this like, is this our coding problem? Are the parameters wrong? Are the dates wrong? Uh, we kept calling this guy, Michael, and... Um, yeah, and he was getting like pretty annoyed. Yeah. I was talking uh, to him and... He was like, in the end, he was like, oh, no, not again, this guy. Yeah, and he's like, oh, they're bugging us again. And like <laughs> he, and then at one point, he was like, I'm going to see if I can remember it through hypnosis. Uh, and we're like, oh, boy, now we're in trouble. <laughs> um, but it turned out, so he had sent us a list of passwords that he had used for other things. And all of them except one were 20 characters with specials or without, I think. I think some. Uh, he told us he used specials as yes. his original password, right. but there were some which didn't use specials. Which special. didn't, right. So yeah. he was so sure it had special characters, but it turns out there was a couple that didn't. So we're like, let's just regenerate without special characters because that changes the entire password that comes out. So we finally did that, and Bruno sends me a message like maybe a, a, like 20 minutes after we started running that list. Yeah. It's very exciting. And I also didn't thought it, it would happen because yeah. he was so sure. He said, like, nah, it, it, it was special characters, like 99%. And then um, we got it. And then we got it. Yeah, so here we, we had to block out all this. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> we had to block out all of the, the transaction history because I know that some of you, if not all of you, would go and try to track it down and now, like, you know, see what this guy's doing and spy on the blockchain and whatever else hackers do these days. Um, but we can see the password was actually generated uh, May 15th, that 2013. And that was actually a little earlier than, than we thought also, based on the transaction history of stuff. But it could also, it could also be that he pressed the button twice, right? Yeah, right. He could have pressed the button enough to like change where, the, where that manipulation was happening. Because the, like how they did it, they, I think, Increased then the time by a fixed amount, which was like around eight or nine days. Yes, and it right. So it, it was subtracting a negative number, and that's what threw us off. We thought it was adding, uh, or we thought it was just subtracting the number, but it was subtracting a negative number, which is adding. So we were going the wrong way in time to try to create our list. But ultimately, it ended up working. But it was pretty dark for a while. There was a couple days when it was like, we just went through all this reverse engineering work. We can generate all these passwords. And it was like, is all of this work going to go wasted? Uh, I mean, I guess it wouldn't be wasted anyway, because other people could use it. But like, from our perspective, it would have been a bummer. Um, as part of this process, uh, sometimes I make YouTube videos. And this was a project where we were like, this would be super fun to film this process and make a fun video out of it to kind of show, you know, the story and the drama. Um, so how many of you have seen our, our video on this? Oh, wow. That's like, that's impressive. That, that's like a quarter maybe. That's good. Um, everyone else, hopefully you watch it. And uh, these are just some behind the scenes of what it takes to film videos like without just using your you know, iPhone. Um, but this particular project, the, the customer who had this wallet is from Germany, but he was in Barcelona on vacation and Bruno's in Germany. So we started kind of our, our process in the video in Germany. We did interviews um, and then flew, oh, here's our film crew, by the way. And then we flew over to Barcelona and Michael, the, this guy, thought that we were just going to ask him more questions and interview him again. Like, he didn't know that by that point we had done it. Um, so he was like, oh, God, now they're just going to ask more things. Um, so it was actually pretty funny. We're not going to reveal, like, the full thing because that's why you should watch the video. It's way, 
more exciting when you watch it there instead of on a tiny screen here. Um, but we basically set up this whole environment like, um, you know, publishers clearing house style kind of reveal, uh, which was totally ridiculous and yeah, very, very fun. Um, and that's part of it is like being able to share this information and, and you know, share some technological stuff is super fun and being able to make videos and like get creative with things that we're doing otherwise equally as fun. So this stuff is really cool. And also you can see how, you know, safety third, um, for those who actually can see the picture, there's two guys holding a gigantic ladder as one guy's like fiddling with some lamps and electrical stuff. Uh, I probably shouldn't have documented that, but definitely not safe. So yeah, um, once we found this issue and we solved our problem, we're like, awesome. Okay, Michael's taken care of. We recovered his Bitcoin, yay. But part of the process of hacking, in my opinion, is sharing that information with other people so they can learn from it and use it. And that's equally as important as, <clears throat> that's equally as important as the success of the project, right? If you just hoard all your information and not share it with anybody else, what's the point? of hacking. I, I think that's, that's something I feel very strongly about and something that, that has been sort of ingrained in me since my younger days of being a hacker. So we solved this problem and we're like, all right, how are we going to disclose this? You know, there's responsible disclosure, um, which I don't really like that term because it implies that not doing that is irresponsible. Um, and there's all sorts of things like when I was at the loft back in a long time ago, uh, we would kind of tell the vendor like, hey, we're going to release this in a week or whatever and really force them to fix things. And now there's a little more kind of ethical dilemma about like how much time do you give a vendor? Do you tell the vendor? We looked up and, and went to the RoboForm website, looked around online, looked at different bug bounty platforms and couldn't find any indication that this company had worked with hackers before or worked with good faith researchers. So we got really worried because in this day and age, you sort of expect software companies will have a security at whatever contact or something, right? Like it was scary to not see that. So we couldn't find it. We start discussing like, what's the, what's the reality of the situation? Are we going to get sued? We know from DEF CON history, there was even a talk actually, I think was it supposed to be today that received a cease and desist letter. And now they're working with lawyers and maybe they're going to be able to give the talk on Sunday. Like it's a real risk for, for researchers and nobody wants to get sued, especially when it's a company that has lots of lawyers and we're like individual people that don't want to deal with that. Um, but if it came down to it, we would. Uh, and I remember also talking to my wife about this of like, should we release this information? Like, I really want to talk about it at DEF CON and do something with Bruno, like on stage. And she's like, like, of course, like you're a hacker, like you need to go against these companies and do it. And if you get sued, at least you'll have given the talk first, <laughs> well, which I agree with. So that, that's my little rant. So um, we reached out to, to Kim Zetter, who uh, is a fantastic journalist with cybersecurity um, and has really been pushing, you know, the good of what hackers can do and also has written some books about some like wild state sponsored adversary type of stuff. Um, and she wanted to write about the story. So we we're like, great, she can reach out to the company and kind of get a sense of how litigious they are, like what's going on. So she wrote the story, reached out to them to get some comment about our work. And they basically were like, oh, we fixed the problem, not a big deal. And then she wrote back and was like, well, how did you fix the problem? Nothing. Crickets. Um, and I thought that was a really also another kind of indicative thing, right? Of like, okay, if they're not responding, like it should be very clear if you, if you fix a security problem, First of all, you should notify all your customers if you make a, a significant change like that, um, which didn't happen. But you would also want to be very proud of your changes and say, this is what we did to fix it so you can trust our software that you're running. None of that. This is, it almost feels like I'm in the 90s again, talking about this stuff. Um, so she didn't get any, any meaningful comment. Article came out, no, no comment. You know, a lot of journalists reached out, nothing. Um, maybe this is, maybe this is more typical than I think, but I was really surprised of not getting any sort of feedback. Uh, and then we decided, okay, article came out same time. Let's release the video and then let's do our DEF CON talk. And I think it's, you know, it's, it, it's a concern. I guess I also want to ask how many of you have been in the same situation of like finding some vulnerability and being worried about talking to the vendor and, and getting sued. That's a lot of people. That's probably. 25, 30 people just in this room. Um, 
Multiply that by the number of people at DEF CON, multiply that by the number of people outside who are also hacking. Like, is this a significant enough problem? And vendors know that, um, but it is, it is a real thing. So anyway, yeah, we released all of the information and, uh, and I think that's the important way to go. And, and hopefully, <laughs> hopefully I, I don't uh, make my next video from jail or something like that. Um, so some future work, right. So we don't know how they fix the problem. Maybe future versions, you know, they say they increased the randomness of generated passwords. Maybe they did. We searched through the code. We couldn't find any direct calls to system time. It could have been obfuscated. We don't know. Maybe that's future work. Maybe, maybe not for us. Maybe for one of you who go, ooh, let's go dig into this, right, and see what they fixed. Um, already since we released our code, uh, my friend, our friend Dean Pierce from Portland, woohoo, 503, um, has already taken our code and optimized it to be over 600 times faster, almost probably a thousand times faster depending on the machine, where we were generating 100 passwords a second. Dean was generating 68,000 passwords a second uh, per core. So he made it multi-core. And he removed the need to directly set system time, which requires administrator access, by getting rid of that whole call to system time and just putting a value into that register. So you don't have to call system time, you just plop whatever Unix time you want into there. And then what else did you do? You did one other thing. Um, oh, you don't need to, uh, to call the DLL each time, which in our code we're calling the DLL because it's like resetting some things that we're not exactly sure about, which takes a lot of time. You're just reseeding the random number generator directly? Uh, not, not being out the part that uh, like that directly. Oh, okay, so it's nopping out part of, the, so you're patching a different part of the DLL, nopping out some parts that's reseeding something so you don't have to keep calling the, the DLL, which is a huge time savings. Um, and then he made it command line. Our code, you had to like change the parameters, recompile it, run it. His is now command line. You put in your start time, your end time, your parameters, and you let it run. And now you can create your rainbow, you know, rainbow tables of all of your passwords with the RoboForm password generator uh, that have been computed prior to apparently their fix in, uh, in 2015 for 7.9.14. And maybe, maybe other stuff. Who knows what's going to come out of this? Uh, and a couple of resources. Again, this, these slides will be available. These are clickable links, um, but all the code is available. All of Dean's code is also available um, on GitHub and also linked to from the website. And then the original Wired article and then the video uh, that is, um, is on YouTube. So that's our story about hacking RoboForm. Any last words? I mean, this should also really put in the perspective that uh, I showed you the examples of the um, poor seeded random number get generators and there was like U standard Unix password uh, manager and Kaspersky so it is probably in many things we haven't checked yet just because we thought okay this must be secure so yes widespread right this is not the only thing it's still happening go out there and and find random number generators and you too can also hack time so thank you for coming <laughs> <laughs>